Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to welcome you to this afternoon session with Jason Hatch, and I would like to thank you for joining us. And I would also like to thank the conference organizers as well as the technician. Thanks, Jeff, who's joining us here today. My name is Kelly Main, and I'm an executive member of OHASTA here in the Ontario History and Social Sciences Organization. We've worked all summer with Alberta and Manitoba to create this opportunity today. Uh, unlike Alberta and Manitoba, we don't have PD days today. Um, so I know many of my Ontario colleagues will be watching this recording afterwards. Uh, recently, I stepped back into the role of Department Head of History and Social Sciences, and I'm in Cambridge in the Waterloo Region District School Board as a treaty partner and a seventh generation settler uh, and educator on the Haldeman Track promise to the Haudenosaunee um, in, the, in 1783. Four, and of course, the Anishinaabe Atawandaran peoples have been here since time immemorial before that. I'm now spending a lot of my energy on mobilizing my privilege um, and that of others to understand the real truth of treaties with staff and students in the broader community. And using inquiry, as we probably all know, um, in the classroom, this is probably the best way for all students to learn how to think, how to express themselves, and gain the skills that they need to challenge the racist and sexist legacies the, of the colonial system. So today, I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Jason Hatch, who is committed to such inquiry practice that involves all students. He's the law teacher at Strathroy District Collegiate Institute, uh, just west of London, not too far from me in Southern Ontario. And he is also on the, uh, the on London OGEN committee. So he's co-chair of that organization, um, which is the Ontario Justice Education Network. And I asked him as well, if he could share a little bit about that today, because if you don't know about that organization, they're, they're there to help you. Um, so he has contributed his classroom expertise several times uh, with OHASTA members. And so we thank him for sharing uh, with us again today. And he has everything organized and ready to go. So thank you, Jason. That's great, Kelly. Thank you so much. Uh, so just uh, as Kelly said, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the OGEN committee here in London. And, and just to kind of touch on that quickly, um, even though it's based here in Ontario and some of the topics and some of the materials do uh, kind of focus and skew a little bit more to Ontario because of our federal and unitary system in terms of criminal justice, um, there's a lot of really, really great resources that are available out there for you. Um, if you just go to OGEN. Uh, I think it's, yeah, ogen.ca. Um, there are criminal mock trials and civil mock trials, and there's lots of resources that help to make law more accessible in the classroom. So I very, very much encourage you to, uh, to go to that. There's always some really new and interesting things going on. Um, and actually next Wednesday, there's gonna be a, a Twitter moot where schools across Ontario are gonna be uh, competing and discussing with each other. Section 43 of the criminal code, which is corporal punishment. Should we be getting rid of corporal punishment? Because section 43 says that anybody who is a parent standing in place of a parent or a teacher is allowed to use um, uh, allowed to use corporal punishment in order to um, you know, correct a child. And so there's going to be a discussion about that. And the students are going to participate in uh, in 280 characters to to uh, to go either in for for it or against it. So take a look at OGEN. Um, and if you have any questions, you can email me about that or about the presentation. But um, in order to make sure that we get out of here on time, especially because it's Friday and it's nice where we are, hopefully the same for you, we will uh, get going. Uh, I won't be able to see the chat while I'm presenting. So if you have any questions at any time, just unmute yourself and, and ask. We're going to do a brief activity, uh, hopefully somewhere around 2.20, 2.25, in order to um, uh, have those discussions. And yeah, I think Kelly has uh, shared the folder there. Uh, there's going to be two things that we're going to be looking at. The first is a Google folder, which is with all the resources that we're going to be looking at today in our presentation. And there's also a Jamboard at the end where we can kind of post our questions and our ideas. And, and if we wanted to make contact uh, with each other afterwards, there's that available as well. So I'm going to share my screen and we will get going. Uh, Kelly, are you able to, are you able to see that? Yes, I can see that. And I can also monitor the chat while, uh, while you're talking as well. If, if anybody doesn't want to unmute themselves and ask a question, just put it in the chat and I can ask it for you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. So obviously, this is about doing social studies, and and with um, the the theme and the topic of the presentation, I've really focused on the idea of engagement and inquiry, um, and engagement being that key piece because we want to make sure that our students are um, not only learning but having fun. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in Manitoba and Alberta, but in uh, in Ontario, social studies, history, geography, um, the social sciences, the vast majority of them are electives, and so we kind of do need to engage and entice students to take our classes at the senior level and so that's hopefully what we're going to be doing today and and hopefully that you can take something away today and maybe implement in your class on monday uh so uh perfect uh so just taking a look at what we're going to do we're going to talk about the details we're going to talk about what experiential learning could look like in the classroom we're going to do a little bit of an activity and then we're going to consolidate and and try to answer any questions that you may have so that you can go forward and be successful in the future so what are we doing and why are we doing? Uh, the big concept and what we wanna take away from this presentation is that we wanna create experiences that really mirror what our students are going to do in their professional practice. If, if our kids want to be geography uh, geographers or historians or researchers or lawyers, we wanna make sure that we're uh, giving them the tools in order to be successful at the next step. And if the next step is university or, or workplace or, or anywhere in between, we want to make sure that we're giving them these tools um, in the classroom so they can develop these concepts and these, these understandings. Um, we want to make sure that we're giving them real world experiences here in the classroom so that they understand what we're doing in the classroom has value as we move forward. Um, this is just a, a, a quote from uh, during some of the feedback that we did with one of our experiential uh, activities with our students. Uh, and you can see it there that they, they see a connection. They see the ability about applying our knowledge rather than just being tested on it or regurgitating it. Uh, the, the students, when we do experiential learning and we get up out of our seats and we actually do stuff, they start to see the value in it and they start to see how it's going to work in their real life. And we're going to talk more about where this quote came from in terms of the project that we did that, uh, that elicited it um, and to take a look at other things that are, we are doing. So the big thing is we have to understand first what experiential learning is actually all about. Um, as you can see on the left hand side of the, uh, the screen, it's about the application of theory to real world experiences. You can do it in the classroom, in the community, in the workplace. But the main idea is that it's the application of our learning. And we do experiential learning all the time without even realizing it. Um, as you know, in education, we like to slap fancy new labels on things that we've been doing for years. And with experiential learning, it's not too dissimilar from that, um, but it's really making sure we're targeted in what we're learning and making sure that it can be applied in the real world. Um, and if you look on the right-hand side from Carleton University, um, they've identified some key points about what, what experiential learning is and why it's important. Um, the thing that I really, really like is that fourth point there, increases student engagement. If students are buying into your course, if students are buying into your classroom, they're going to learn more, they're going to enjoy, they're gonna to wanna to be there. And, and that's a, a, a key thing that we need to remember. Uh, so the, the key thing that I like to think about and what I always tell my students is don't tell me that you can do it, show me that you can do it. As a law teacher, one of the things that we do a lot is mock trial. Uh, the picture that you see there is actually from our final exam a couple of years ago. Uh, we were able to book a courthouse and a courtroom and we went and actually had, instead of a traditional final exam, we went and did a mock trial. So the students used the knowledge that they gained all throughout the year and they applied it in a criminal trial. Uh, we were able to go to St. Thomas and we had a retired lawyer come and act as our judge and the students were able to you know, wear the gowns and, and sit behind a bench and, and sit in a witness box. And so it was a very different experience for what a final exam traditionally was. Um, and the students really enjoyed it and the, uh, the assessment was higher, the engagement was higher. And as an added bonus for me, I saw a lot of those grade 11 students in my grade 12 class. And again, as an elective, if I wanna keep teaching what I, uh, what I wanna teach, it's important that I'm engaging these students and, and getting that buyback and, and getting that uh, buy-in. So looking at what can we actually do in the classroom? And this is an important thing because we do it a lot more than we realize, but there's always still more that we can do. Um, so why should we start doing more experiential learning? Well, we want to make sure that we're preparing our students for careers in Canadian world studies and social sciences and social studies. If our kids are wanting to do this, they need the groundwork and that's what we really provide. 
We need to make our classrooms more engaging. We want to encourage critical thinking and collaboration. Uh, if we look at the global competencies, the ideas of critical thinking and collaboration are so important in, in the future and moving forward in order for uh, students to get the jobs that they want, in order to be happy. These are the things we need to focus on. These are where these are the job skills that our employers are really looking at. Uh, we want to look at the critical thinking concepts in our different disciplines. So obviously in history, political science, geography and, and law, there are things like um, historical and legal perspective, uh, legal significance, continuity and change and interrelationships. Now, obviously across the different disciplines, there's uh, differences in between what each of those definitions mean, but we want to make sure that we're identifying these, these thinking concepts in order to make sure that our students are successful. And then finally, it's just, it's a lot more fun than actually sitting there. It's, um, we might be really, really great at what we do and want to be really, really knowledgeable people, but we have to make sure that the kids are engaged and we want them to make sure that the kids are enjoying themselves. For students to sit there for 75 minutes or as we have in some boards in Ontario right now, two and a half hours, we need kids to buy in and we need the students to um, want to be there in order to be successful. So right now my classes are two and a half hours. We need to do a lot more than just have me talk to them uh, and talk at them. And so that's what we're looking at with experiential. So some traditional examples of experiential learning, they're usually seen as a lot bigger and more expensive activities. Um, they're field trips, they're big class time commitments. If we're taking a kid for a field trip, it takes them out of the school for the whole day. I know with a lot of my grade 12s that they have math in the same semester, they don't want to go on these field trips because they don't want to miss math or science or their other courses because of the importance that are uh, the important things that are going on there. Um, some of the projects that I've run before, the the, the uh, the, fin the final exam of the courthouse, it was almost a uh, $1,000 in terms of our busing and making sure we had supply teacher coverage and, and anything else like that. We've run other activities where we've done classroom to courtroom where we brought kids to the university and the law school here in London at Western University. We brought them to law firms and we brought them to the courthouse. And, you know, these very, very quickly add up in terms of cost. So what else, uh, what other examples um, do you know of or maybe that you've done that are larger examples of maybe traditional experiential learning? So uh, opening it up to, to anybody else. I'm just thinking of the, yeah, I'm thinking of the, bl the blanket exercise um, that we did a lot in the before times, before COVID, you know, all of these interactive, especially when we're trying to get the Indigenous content in now, um, these really important experiences we can't do that involve multiple classes or, yeah, leaving the classroom. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, when we're bringing people in, we have restrictions on that now, obviously, and there are costs associated with things like that. Um, anytime you leave a building is very, very expensive. And so that can deter some people from um, trying to do these larger experiential learning activities. Um, we but, also, yeah, we well, also have people in the chat. Sorry, Jason, just mentioning in class oh, elections. Yes. Yeah, visiting yep. places for water testing and geography. Um, yeah, visiting the courthouses when there is actually a, a session in progress <laughs> and a school of archaeology from one school. Yeah, and those are really incredible ideas. And those, that's exactly what experiential learning is. And and that was, a, that, that was a couple of excellent examples. And if you couldn't think of an example, you're probably already doing experiential learning. In history, a primary source evaluation is something that is absolutely experiential because that's what a historian would do. Um, for geographers, if you walk through the neighborhoods, if you do mapping activities, that's experiential learning. Um, family studies, cooking and food prep, anything where you have the students doing something that would mirror what the person would actually do professionally, you absolutely are doing that. So again, opening it up to, uh, to the larger group, what are some examples that you can think of now that might be experiential, things that you're doing in the classroom already that aren't the big time consuming things? We're getting some more messages here in the chat about cross-curricular role plays um, mm -hmm. and virtual meets with a Holocaust survivor. I know that a few organizations offer that now and also the court experience online. Um, mm -hmm. There's also an EA who made models for kids to do the blanket exercise at their desks. So it looks like there's some innovation happening as well for some of these smaller experiences. 
Absolutely. And I love that you were, use that word uh, innovative, Kelly, because that's really what experiential learning is. And, and with the current situation we have, we're being forced to be more innovative. And that's what we want to look at. And, and these are all really innovative and interesting ideas that get our students doing rather than just kind of being a recipient of this information. So these are some of the student responses that we've we've had from our uh, experiential learning activities and the different things that we've done throughout our courses. Um, you know, it, with the exam, looking at the one in the red, people freeze up during a written test. And with this, it was more chill and you're able to get more out of us. And that's really what we want. We want students to be able to apply their knowledge and really demonstrate their understanding so that they're happy with what they're doing. And so if you can alleviate stress and anxiety going into a, an evaluation or an activity, the students are going to perform better. Um, so many of our students are, are uh, also hands-on. They uh, they want to be doing something. They don't like to sit. I'm not someone who can sit very well either for a long period of time. So uh, I like to be up and moving around and doing. And I imagine a lot, a lot of our kids are that way as well. So that's why it's important to make sure that we're looking at what students need um, in order to be successful and tailoring our activities and what we're doing to make sure that they're doing that as well. So as I said, you know, we did the exam. These are just some examples of the uh, of what some of the students did. We see in the bottom right hand corner, we actually engaged the police to act as the police witness. Um, the, the case studies that we use come from OGEN. We used a case where a student uh, or a young person had a gun. Another young person was charged with theft. Another young person was charged with possession of um, marijuana and ecstasy. And so the kids actually do these roles and they stand up in a courtroom and, and they act as a crown prosecutor or as, a, or as a defense attorney. They act as a witness and they get to engage with each other and see what's actually going on. And, and they, they love having the lawyer um, with us. They love having the police there in order to make it more real. And that's the key thing is they always talk about how real these activities actually are. Um, if you did want to listen to the cases, we did have them recorded by our communications technology department and uh, in that class. So if you ever did want to listen to it to see what it sounded like, you can go to um, after our after our presentation when the resources are distributed and you can hear the cases. You can actually hear what the kids did and, and how well they did. And you, you can hear the enthusiasm and the engagement in their voices and as they're talking to each other. So. The big thing that we always have to look at is how can we connect this to the curriculum? And here in Ontario, our, our social studies and our Canadian world studies programs and our curriculum has been updated in the last six or seven years and to different strands. And the strand in all of our Canadian world studies documents are called inquiry and skill development. And these are the things that need to be spread out all throughout our course. And these are the things that every evaluation and pretty much everything we should be doing should have these strands in there. Looking at that A2 in each of the politics, the history and the, the law, it's all about developing transferable skills. Because even though I have kids who are taking my law class and I have four law classes a year, I might only be sending one or two off ever uh, in, in a year to go be a lawyer. So I have to take a look at what are the transferable skills that these other 100 or so kids might be taking away that they can take to their their job in their workplace. So this is a, a good look at how we can tailor our our experiential learning to make sure we hit the curriculum uh, connections in Canadian world studies. But it also exists in all of our social sciences and even our elementary programs. So when we're looking at um, some of the social sciences, Things that, uh, the demographics, if we were to do a research tool and use the primary source uh, data from Save Stats Canada to create a demographic model of a particular area or um, a particular issue or event, that's an experiential learning uh, activity. When we look at the idea of media and popular culture, and again, doing primary source materials, looking at approaches and perspectives, these are all things that you can design experiential activities all around. And then even going looking at our elementary geography expectations. Um, what are interrelationships that contribute to global inequalities? Looking at the big ideas and the framing questions. And so the, the curriculum expectations are all there for us and they mesh really, really well with the experiential learning, which is all about doing. Making sure the kids are up and out of their seats. Sorry, that's the end of our school day. Up and out of their, their seats, doing things. So again, a whole list of things that you that can be done. Um, if you're running politics or civics related classes, you've probably done something like a mock election or a mock parliament 
Uh, in history, you could have a trial of historical person. We can do a mix or a role play, which we're going to look at in our in our breakout rooms. We've done constitutional conventions. We've redone confederation. You can do a Paris Peace Conference. We're going to take a look at a Yalta Conference, um, and we're going to do a First Minister's Conference. So all of these things are all about assuming a particular role and becoming that person and doing that activity and doing that method. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to take a look at something that hopefully we can take and maybe implement even on Monday or Tuesday as we go back into our classes. And this is where our breakout activity is going to come out. We're going to break up into, I, I think, three groups. Kelly, how many people do we have in the, uh, in the room? We now have 43 people. Okay. Um, then I, I guess let's break up into, to make it a little bit more manageable, if we can break up into six Six groups, please. So we can break up into six groups and we'll have two groups do activity one, two groups do activity two, and two groups do activity three. So, so each group you're gonna be- Just it, let me, just let me uh, interrupt, sorry for one second. If you could just open up uh, Jason's material in the Google folder I just posted in the chat, this is where the activities will be and you'll need to uh, have these when you go into your uh, breakout group. That's great, sorry about that, thanks Kelly. And so what I want you to do is when you're in the breakout rooms to take a look at the documents that are specific to your, uh, your activity, whether it be the Yalta conference, it be the mixer, there are three mixers available. So you can take a look at what they are. And then the first minister's conference. And what I'd like you to do is maybe talk with each other and come up with some ideas about um, what you liked about it, what you don't like about it, questions you may have for it, things you would want to, you would want maybe other supports and resources to help make it better um, and talk about how we could bring this into our classroom and how we think it could help to stir experiential learning. Um, if somebody could kind of just uh, act as a recorder or a reporter um, when we come back to have a bit of a discussion as the larger group, that would be really, really helpful. So the three breakout rooms or three breakout groups, uh, there'll be obviously, like I said, two rooms for each of them. The mixers are where you look at a particular historic um, event. We're doing housing simulations, uh, Seneca Falls, and I'm drawing a blank on the last one. Um, in a mixer, what you do is you assume the role of a historical person, um, and you then go and talk to other members in the classroom in order to answer a series of questions. So this is really focusing on the idea of historical, legal, and political perspective. Understanding why people have acted the way they've acted and done the things that they've done and the impact that they've had on each other. Uh, the next one is going to be the Yalta simulation coming from the University of Minnesota. And this is a really fun activity that can be done small scale in one class, or you can blow it up into something larger, where you're going to go as the... Um, as the Soviet delegation, the British delegation, or the American delegation to try to come up with some sort of idea about a post-war plan after World War II. And then finally, there's a first minister's meeting where uh, you uh, break up the class into the prime minister and the cabinet and his their advisors. And then you also break off into the provinces with their leaders and their advisors. And you try to come up with some sort of agreement based on something. And in this case, uh, the one I posted is about equalization. Very, very timely given the uh, the referendum that was just held in Alberta, where I think there's a slight majority of Albertans said that they would like to um, deal with equalization in a different way or not have it exist. So um, something a little timely there. So you can uh, go into your breakout rooms and um, take a look at your documents. And again, try to identify some things that... Um, you like about them, maybe things that are lacking, supports and resources that you might need, and how we can bring these into um, into our classroom. And chat about other things that you're doing, other experiential activities that you're doing in your classes that are successful for you, because if they're successful for you, very well they're gonna be successful for a whole bunch of other kids across our country. So um, if we could be put into the breakout rooms for about 12, yeah, let's go for about 12 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes, and then we can come back and uh, and have a larger discussion to see what we thought of them. Oh, that was fun. Thanks, Jason. That was, wow, good brainstorming in our group. Yeah, I heard, uh, just kind of going back and forth between everything, a lot of really good discussion. So um, I know we only have a few minutes left, so I don't know if we can maybe do it in like four minutes. Was there anything like that was big or interesting that you guys uh, that you guys thought or that's something that piqued your interest or anything like that? 
Well, I, I think our group, we talked about the Yalta conference and I think um, we kind of, we got around to it at the end, but I think this is true of most experiential uh, programming is that having reflection piece at the end of everything that you're doing that kind of ties together, not, not just like the content of what you're doing, but also the skills that were used and um, making that part of the, the whole process. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I, sorry, can I interject here or ask a question? The, uh, we had the, the Seneca Falls. We only had time to talk about the Seneca Falls uh, uh, mixer. Um, what I didn't get a chance to, to, to say is that there, there could be some problems or there's a caveat about cross-cultural role play is that um, we have to be careful when we ask students to play someone of a different culture. And so that's, you know, there's a lot of landmines there, uh, potential fallout uh, from that. Absolutely, and, and I think that goes to, that speaks to the idea that we need to make sure we know our students before we pick um, what we wanna do, especially with the mixtures. Um, and we have to understand that there needs to be a relationship between the, the student group and then the, uh, the teacher to make sure we know make sure we know what would be good for our kids and, and to make sure that we're culturally uh, sensitive as we go forward. And then um, I, I, I. Yeah, hi. It's a tough Can class, man. It's all good. Uh, so I was in the same group <laughs> as Daniel as well. And uh, same thing that uh, he mentioned, right? We talked about a couple of the benefits and some of the things that we know is that, hey, this might come up. Uh, we noticed that the actual documents themselves were really nicely laid out and they provided a, a good amount of background knowledge. Uh, some roadblock, roadblocks that we kind of thought about was how much time do you spend on providing that background knowledge, right? Especially with a topic like uh, Seneca Falls or even uh, Standing Rock, like that's, a, that's an, those are events that really do need a good amount of background knowledge to understand and appreciate. And then with that, um, do you have the kids focus on one group, one side, and then they really dive into that. And then when they do the simulation, well, now they're they're experts in that and the other side's experts in what they need to do. So they're both teaching each other or do you have everybody understand the same concepts and then hopefully when they're involved in the simulation, they're building themselves up from that base. Um, we also talked about time, right? If you want to push this out and really make it a uh, appreciated experience, you are gonna add more time to it and that, it, that might come at the cost of other things, other, con other concepts. But what I'm kind of what I'm pulling out of what you're trying to teach and and show us is that you might lose a bit of those extra outcomes, but what it, you're gaining from it is a is a experience that is more memorable, more meaningful, and uh, build skills while also building the content. So I think that's kind of where you you are shaving a bit, but you're building a, a more refined experience. I'm, I'm guessing that's kind of what I pulled out. Absolutely, yeah, and and. I think over the last couple of years, I focus more on that skill development because kids in my class aren't necessarily going to remember specific cases. They may never remember the Feeney case in law, but they're going to remember those skills that we developed. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, every day that you spend more on something is going to be a day that you have less on something else. Um, so everything does come with a cost, absolutely. And, and the more days you take on one thing, you could cannibalize other pieces. So that is absolutely a consideration that you have to take. And, and it's a mix of knowing your kids and knowing your curriculum and, and kind of having that outcome of where do I want to be at the end and then working backwards from there to see how do I get there? Um, because if you just kind of do these things ad hoc and randomly, you're going to eat up your whole semester. And it, it's, it's difficult to kind of get it back and you're like, ah, oh, man, I'm in my Canadian history course. And it's supposed to go to 2020 and I got to 1982. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of planning that does need to be done in order to make these in-class experiences work really effectively and not just be these silos that exist in your course, but things that kind of come together and, and work spatially rather than just in a linear fashion. I will say one be... thing though, it's short interjection. I, I apologize. Um, when you're looking at the Dakota pipeline one, she was framing it from 1900 to that present day. So you could hit all those different outcomes within that time range too. So I think that was, that's interesting to do, like pick an event and then work backwards kind of thing. Yeah. And so you, yeah, absolutely. So it's easy to say, you know, do this on Monday, but you do need to have a little bit of understanding and kind of some thinking about where does this fit in, in the continuum of my course. I know obviously with working in three different provinces right now, 
um, and talking to people in three different provinces, our curriculum expectations are different and and levels are different. So that's why it can be a little bit difficult to just kind of say like do this as a as a big overview. One of the, uh, the the blessings and burdens of being a social studies teacher is that we integrate or immerse our lessons with what's going on today. And so someone mentioned the elections that was recent. And so that takes up a big part of our of our curriculum, our normal curriculum. But I mean, if you're one who, if you're a news junkie like myself, there's always inspiration wherever you see to, to come up with some sort of experiential activity. For example, yesterday, uh, we had a great session in my civics class about the Muslim called the prayer being broadcast in the city of Mississauga and other cities. And it was a wonderful discussion. And we talked about community and about diversity and about, about minority groups and accommodation. And it was one of the best lesson plans ever. And I, I'd love to say that I had planned everything exactly, <laughs> but I started off with an idea and it and it worked wonderfully, right? It just, mm -hmm. it, uh, you start on a path and then you, sometimes the things just click. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that, Daniel. Uh, just in the interest of time, unfortunately, we, we do have to move on. So I'm just going to take over the screen again real quick for the last few moments. Uh, um, if you're interested in, in learning more about experiential learning, um, there are some links as well that are there. Now, obviously, they are Ontario centric, um, but things are there now. In Ontario, our big thing is to have experiential learning leads. Um, so people who are working at the board level who help you. And I make extensive use of Nikita Miller, who's our experiential lead. And she was just in, a, I think, last week with me or the week before. And, um, and we're planning another project for elementary schools. Um, so make sure that you're using the people who are at the board. Oftentimes they have money that you can access too. So they can really, really help in a whole bunch of different ways. So you can use those links to um, help to give you some ideas. There's a Jamboard as well. So you can just put some sticky notes about, you know, what do you want to do? What resources do you need or help do you need? What are you stuck on? And we can kind of create a bit of a community to help each other as we move forward through the rest of the semester, the next year or, or whatever it is. So if you do want to connect with uh, some of our colleagues, you can um, access that material there. Um, and we unfortunately don't have time for questions, but if you do have any questions, you can always email me, j.hatch at tvdsb.ca. You can follow what my law class is doing at STCI Law on Twitter. And I really, really thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your, your day and coming to do this and to chat. And I really, really hope that you were able to pull something out of this and that you found it useful. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jason. That was really great. A lot of uh, theory behind the, the methods, you know, to the madness. And I would like everybody please to check out the exhibitors rooms as well as the pre-recorded sessions. There's a lot of gold in this conference and we really appreciate each and every one of you and your time and Jason, excellent. Let's keep that Jamboard going. Let's keep the talking going. And we're here to help you. OHASTA has lots of webinars up from this past year. Um, we could maybe have Jason do another one. We should be uh, capitalizing. Uh, there's a need, right? When you're teaching the social sciences, as I know, you're in your own silo, right? You said you are the yeah. teacher at your school. So all yeah. of you guys can find your peeps. Yeah, that would be really wonderful. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend and hope to see you later today. And tomorrow uh, is the uh, Critical Thinking Consortium. A lot of great historical thinking. And I'm hosting Maria Van Bellis tomorrow. Um, she is going to help people, especially white um, folk, in decentering their curriculum. And, and it's going to be a working thinking time um, that's going to be wonderful. So plugging her session tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend.